On behalf of Chancellor Wartell, I want to welcome you to the first Omnibus Lecture of 2012. My name is Irene Walters, and I work with the Omnibus Steering Committee to develop each season of nationally known speakers. My department is also responsibility for other events that bring the community to campus. I hope that tonight you were able to experience our new fabulous thousand space parking garage in the Fine Arts Plaza. We've all been waiting for that for a while, haven't we? So. <laughs> Since 1995, the Omnibus Lecture Series has been sponsored by English Bonner Mitchell Foundation, whose support has allowed IPFW to host, counting tonight, 98 outstanding, entertaining, and remarkable national personalities. Thanks to our sponsor's generosity, all the Omnibus Lectures are free to campus and to the public. I also want to thank our, our media sponsors, Wayne TV and Northeast Indiana Public Radio, who have also been with us for all 98 lectures. Tonight's speaker, Michelle Norris, is an NPR personality, journalist, and author. Toni Morrison said of her book, The Grace of Silence, a Family Memoir, it is an insightful, elegant rendering of how the history of an American family illuminates the history of our country. We'll hear a little more about our speaker from Will Murphy in just a minute. But first, I'd like to invite you to put on your calendar two dates, March 13th, which is our next lecture, when we will hear from noted education historian Diane Ravitch. And then, please save April 12th for our very, very special 100th Omnibus Lecture. More details will follow in March, but you're not going to want to miss that one, I promise. And we'd love you to help us celebrate our 100th by telling us your Omnibus story. How many lectures have you attended? Who is your favorite speaker and why? If you go to the Omnibus website, omnibuslectures.org, click on your story and give us your info. Now, just let me remind you about the format of this program. After the lecture, there will be a question and answer period. There is one microphone stand on the lower level and one on the upper level, where you can stand in line, ask your question, rather than shouting it from your seat, because we can't hear you if you do that. And then after the Q&A, there will be a book signing in the lobby. And now I am pleased to introduce Will Murphy, General Manager of Northeast Indiana Public Radio, who will introduce our speaker. Will? Thank you very much, Irene. And uh, our thanks to you and to IPFW for bringing Michelle here this evening. As I'm sure everyone here knows, Michelle Norris is a voice uh, familiar to listeners of public radio. She joined NPR in 2002, co-hosting All Things Considered. And as you may know, recently she recused herself from the anchor's chair uh, during the election cycle uh, while her husband serves as a, uh, an advisor to the Obama campaign. But she continues to report and produce. Uh, she's the primary catalyst for one of what I think is the best ideas NPR's had in a long, long time, the ATC series, The Backseat Book Club. It's a, a service, if you haven't heard it, it's a service for all those poor, hapless children that are trapped in the back seats of uh, cars driven by their well-meaning NPR-loving parents. <laughs> and if you haven't checked it out, I really do recommend it. It's a wonderful uh, series that encourages literacy among children. Uh, Ms. Norris has worked in print as well as broadcast journalism, working at the uh, LA Times, the Washington Post, and the Chicago Tribune. Before coming to NPR in 2002, she spent 10 years at uh, ABC News, covering education, America's drug problem, uh, poverty, and the inner city. She was awarded both an Emmy and a Peabody for her reporting on the aftermath of the 9-11 attacks. And at NPR, her 2008 work on a series about politics and race helped garner an Alfred DuPont Award for Excellence in Broadcasting. 
In 2005, the National Association of Black Journalists bestowed the Salute to Excellence Award for her coverage of Hurricane Katrina. And this is only a partial listing of her many professional accolades. In 2010, Ms. Norris authored a memoir, The Grace of Silence, which looks at the issue of race in the wake of the Obama uh, presidency, and which also explores the unspoken legacies of race in her own family, which, as you may know, has a significant connection to Fort Wayne. Let me close my introduction by noting simply that Michelle Norris and her work manifest the ideals that we should all aspire to in public broadcasting, civility, respect, thoroughness, balance, accuracy, and compassion. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Michelle Norris. Good evening. Oh, let's try that again. It's too great an evening for that. Good evening. Yes. Thank you. And thank you, Will, for that wonderful introduction. I have only been in Fort Wayne a brief period of time, but I have had such a wonderful time here. I have met so many wonderful people. I've had delicious food. Um, I've talked about politics and theater and education and engineering, and, um, and we haven't even got to the main part of the evening. So this has been um, a wonderful day so far for me. Well, as I listen to your introduction, I always laugh when people talk about my voice and how I use my voice on the radio because I have two young children, and perhaps that was the impetus for me creating or, or, or urging NPR to create the Backseat Book Club. My kids are 11 and 12 years old, and they always turn to me, um, they often turn to me in interesting moments, and they say, Mommy, can we have the radio voice? <laughs> and I have to tell them, you know, clean your room, and you get the radio voice. <laughs> Otherwise, you get something else. <laughs> uh, it's a pleasure to, to talk to you tonight about, um, about uh, my book, um, and about the lessons that I've learned since the book was published, because that really has been the most interesting and surprising part of the, the journey for me. Whenever I look at this book, I, I'm sort of struck by two little words that follow the main title. It's called uh, The Grace of Silence, a Family Memoir. And it's really the word memoir that I still um, get sort of stuck on because this wasn't supposed to be a memoir. This is in every way an accidental memoir. When I sat down to write a book, my intention was to try to capture this interesting moment in America where I thought that there was this really fascinating conversation about race and culture and identity that was percolating in all kinds of interesting places. And it flowed from the work I did with Steve Inskeep, who is an Indiana native, um, and work we did together in York, Pennsylvania uh, in a series of conversations called York and the 2008 Vote. And what we did is we brought a group of voters together, um, that very diverse group of voters together, and we wanted to have an open conversation about race and politics and, and culture. And it was really a, a magical experience. I don't brag on my work very much, but I was really proud of this. It was, it was magical radio, and it wasn't because it had very high production values. There weren't a lot of bells and whistles. It was just a really open, honest, candid, no-holds-barred conversation about race that was civil, um, and yet it sometimes made you uncomfortable. Sometimes it made you laugh, sometimes it made you squirm. And we were able to achieve that by putting people in a room and creating a safe space for them to have that conversation. Steve um, insisted that the room had to have a hearth because he thought that that would make people comfortable. So the producers went all over York, Pennsylvania trying to find a meeting space that had a hearth in it. I mean, they found a, a perfect space for that. I had one requirement. It had to have, um, the conversation had to begin with a meal. 
I thought if we broke bread together that we would sort of, we would find each other easy, more easily. And at the end of that process, where we asked people very simple questions, very simple questions. Um, do blacks make too much of race? Do white Americans underestimate the notion of privilege? When Sarah Palin was in the race at this point, we asked people, when she talks about Joe Sixpack, what does he look like? Is he Asian or Latino? And yet we had someone who was a member of our circle who was South Asian, and every other week when his paycheck came, he said he would go and buy a six-pack to celebrate payday. And yet he thought probably correctly that she didn't have him in mind when she made that statement. <laughs> At the end of that conversation, I wanted more. I thought if I could figure out how to eavesdrop on conversations about race in the most respectful way in strip malls and on college campuses and dormitories and workspaces and church basements, uh, in beauty shops and barber shops, on Main Street and Wall Street, that I could put together an interesting book based on those conversations. My intent was to listen to other people, other people talk about race, but then something happened. When I attuned my radar to try to pick up these conversations, I started to hear really interesting things really close to home. The people that I thought I knew so well, the people who raised me, the elders in my family, were suddenly spilling stories that I had never heard before. And not surprisingly, it always happened over food. It was always when we were sitting down at a table, and it usually was at the hands of my aging uncles, who seemed to be going through a period of historic indigestion. Just these stories were sort of coming out. And I think I understood what was going on. This is not unique to African-American families, but I gather from conversations that I've had now really all over the country that this has been happening in lots of different places. You see, these older people had seen a different kind of America. They had seen America change. And I grew up in a household where that phrase, keep your eye on the prize, you know that phrase. You probably know that song. Well, that was muttered and uttered in our household all the time. And when I was a kid, and it was always interesting to me because I, I thought prize. Oh, I love the idea of a prize. Maybe it'll have a bow on it. And it's like a present waiting for me out there. But as I got older, and I saw what they were saying with older eyes and wiser ears, I understood that that prize was not promised to us, even though it was talked about all the time. Even though they talked about keeping your eye on the prize, it was described as something that was way off in the distance through the hot sands and, and, and past this great mountain range. And even if you thought you got close to it, you still had to go through a moat of boiling oil. And yet something happened with the ascent of this presidential candidate with a rather funny name. Suddenly that prize that they talked about that seemed so distant to them seemed suddenly vroom, like it was right here. Now, there are many people in my family who are deeply conservative, very conservative. And if they ever had a chance to get President Obama in a room as president or even at that time as candidate Obama, they would have an awful lot to say to him. And yet, when they picked up a newspaper and saw a man of color sitting at the White House, sitting behind a great big desk in the White House, someone who looked like one of their sons, something inside them shifted. And for people who supported his candidacy, something in them shifted when they went into a voting booth and picked up a pencil and filled in a little circle next to his name because to dream of voting for an African-American president to them at some point in their life felt like perhaps just trying to reach up and touch the sun. So in the wake of all this, all these stories suddenly started to come out. And I realized that even though I was interested in trying to capture stories in America, what I really needed to do was try to capture the stories that were spilling out at my family dinner table. And as those stories spilled out, what I realized is that I was shaped in many ways by things that had never been spoken of in my home. 
I grew up with parents who were both postal workers. They were hardworking people. They were very quiet people. They were very proudful. They were Midwestern in every sense of the word, even though my father was originally from Birmingham. They didn't talk a lot about their history. They only meted it out in little, 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 little dribbles. So we knew enough about the hardships that they, that they experienced, but they didn't want to burden us with that. And even though they didn't talk about it, what I realized is that I was shaped by many of these things. And I'm, if I can, I just want to read you a little bit from the introduction because it'll give you a sense of, of what I discovered. I've always known that my racial identity as an African-American woman has been largely forged by the sum of experiences in my lifetime and my most formative memories flow through my parents' lives from their struggles and tribulations, their triumphs and celebrations, their dignity found through a hard day's work, the devotion of our worship, the places we lived, and above all, the constant expectation captured by one word, rise. Rise and shine. Rise to the occasion. Rise above it all. No matter what, move forward, never backward, always onward and upward. And if you ever feel like you're at the end of your rope, tie a knot and hold on until you can start climbing again. For all of our lives, we were told, keep your eye on the prize, stay strong, keep committed, focus on the fight for justice and equality, set your sights on excellence and opportunity, don't let up, don't look back, don't slow down, ignore the slights and the slurs that keep you, that try to keep you from achieving your goals, always keep the prize in mind, see it, smell it, feel it. Our parents armed us with what they thought we needed, strength, courage, and a touch of indignation, but just a touch. I was shaped by the advice and admonitions that rained down on me. I have always known that. What I did not know until I began this project is that I was also shaped by the weight of my parents' silence. Among those secrets was this. As a young man, my father had been shot by a white policeman. He never spoke about the incident after leaving Alabama and moving north. He never told even my mother. He took the story to his grave. But my mother, too, was hiding something. My mother never talked about the time her mother spent working as a traveling Aunt Jemima, swooping through small Midwestern towns in a hoop skirt and a headscarf to perform pancake-making demonstrations. The memory had caused her shame, so she'd locked it away. These revelations suggested to me that I never had a full understanding of my parents or the formation of my own racial identity. You see, when I discovered these things, again, always at the table, I realized I had to shift course. And that's how I found myself in the land of writing memoir. The stories that I had to uncover um, taught me interesting things about my family, but I wound up learning something very interesting about America. And all the time, I kept asking myself, how did I not know this? I consider all things every day. <laughs> How is it that I didn't know these things that were so close to home? I had no idea that my family story placed people very close to me smack in the center of some really interesting chapters of American history. You know, when I discovered that my grandmother was an itinerant Aunt Jemima, I had to know more. And yet my mother didn't want to talk about this. She was ashamed of it. And you know, you can understand the complicated set of emotions that would be attached to that because uh, you know who Aunt Jemima was. Now, I, and I have to ask you to think about this for a minute because how many of you use Aunt Jemima products in your home? And it's okay, you can, you can raise your hand if you do. Pancake mix, syrup. I, they're in my house. My kids like the lady with the hand on her hip. You know, the cert bottle. Well, I have to ask you to reach past that. Because what I discovered from my Uncle Jimmy, again, at the table, when he spilled the story, is that my grandmother was an itinerant Aunt Jemima in the late 1940s to the early 1950s. She had a six-state region. I was raised in Minnesota. That was one of her states. She also had Wisconsin, Iowa, the Dakotas, and Michigan. And the family hated this story. 
They hated that I wanted to know more about it, and yet I had to know more about it. And though I understood why they were ashamed, I came to a slightly different place when I heard about this because, first of all, if she was doing this in the late 1940s to the early 1950s, that meant she was traveling. At that time in America, women didn't really travel, and black women certainly didn't travel. So I wanted to know more about that. And I was fascinated because the image of Aunt Jemima, at least the image that was prevalent in the late 1940s and early 1950s, did not comport at all with the woman that I know or the woman that I knew because she's now passed on. Her name was Ione Brown, which is interesting because we're in a building right now named for a woman named Ione B. Spame selling. And she was a, a committee woman. Now, if you have a committee woman in your life, you know what I'm talking about. She was always running things. She had clipboards. And she was a little bit officious. Now, actually, she was really officious. She was forever getting the keys to the city in Minneapolis because she, uh, she was running a series of programs, usually for senior citizens. In fact, there's a building in Minneapolis that still bears her name, which is a senior citizen center. And I remembered this woman that was always extremely well put together, even if she was just going to Kroger's. She wore these clothing ensembles that looked like Garanimals for adults. <laughs> she would go out, and if it was a red day, everything would be red, head to toe. If it was a lavender day, the suit would be lavender, or the dress would be lavender, the brooch would be lavender. She would have matching, and it just goes without saying, that her shoes and her bag would match, because at that time, you wouldn't leave the house with brown shoes and a black bag, or you might be cited by the fashion police. So her, her shoes and her bag always matched, and she was always smart and well put together, and she would have, if it was a lavender day, a lavender scarf tied to her pocketbook, a smart little triangular-shaped pocketbook. And when she asked you a question, your, the only acceptable answer was usually, yes, ma'am, whether you were a child or an adult. She just had that aura of authority. But when I learned about her work as a traveling Aunt Jemima, I had, to, I had to think of her in a completely different way. I had to think of her going out into these small towns, dressed, again, not as the woman you see on the pancake box today. The woman on the pancake box today looks like she shops at Macy's. She wears pearls. She gets her hair done once a week. She probably plays canasta on Tuesdays. She's got it together. The woman who used to be on the box, though, looked like a slave woman a mammy character. So I had to imagine this very well put together woman, my grandmother, Ione Brown, taking a scarf and not tying it Jackie O style the way I remember her, wearing it over her well coiffed hair, but instead taking that scarf and pulling it back here and tying it up here. Now you wouldn't even really call it a scarf, it certainly wasn't silk. You might call it a kerchief, do-rag. I had to imagine her standing in front of a mirror and hiking up a hoop skirt, a hoop skirt, and then tying an apron around her waist. I had to imagine her patting herself a little bit because she was supposed to look buxom, and while she was a large woman, she wasn't as big as the woman on the pancake box. And I had to imagine her going through this ritual and then try to also imagine the hard bargain that she made with herself to do this kind of work. I never had a chance to talk to her about any of this because she didn't, this was not talked about in my family. Again, I learned about this by accident, but I got lucky. I was fortunate because when I started to dig, I found stories of other traveling Aunt Jemimas. And I found newspaper reporting. You see, there, were, there was an army of them at that time. There was the main spokesperson, who was very well known in America. Aunt Jemima was the number two advertiser in the country in this period. But there were these army of, of uh, so-called pinch hitters that would go to small town fairs and Rotarian breakfasts. And they would do these pancake demonstrations. And I know you must be thinking, well, wait a minute. How hard can it be? If you know about Aunt Jemima pancake mix, it's just mix water and stir. But at the time, they were introducing convenience cooking. And so part of her role was to go out primarily in small towns and convince farm women 
that it was really better to use a box mix as opposed to making pancakes from scratch, even though it's only about six ingredients, which says something about their salesmanship. When I found these newspaper clippings about my grandmother's work, I learned something essential about her work and how she did it. Under the headline, Aunt Jemima's Coming to Town, reporter interviewed her about how she did her work, and she talked about going into towns where she knew she was meeting people who had never seen a Negro woman before. And so she saw herself as an ambassador. She said in these articles that she would speak in a certain way, and she would carry herself in a certain way because she wanted to leave a strong impression. Now this rang very true to me. You know that thing I talked about that the elders felt when something shifted in them? Something shifted in me when I heard that because my grandmother was someone, she was, um, she had been, she had won several oratory contests when she was a kid and she always let us know about that and she did speak with very crisp diction. And so you heard every consonant in every word, especially when she was upset. <laughs> and as kids, when we were all at her house on Saturday mornings, all of my, my cousins and I were at her house, ironically often having pancakes, she would always fuss at us about the sort of slang of the day because we would be talking about how we were thinking about doing something or fixing to do something. And she would say, excuse me, excuse me. This is Minnesota, it's cold outside. Mr. G is standing outside. Maybe we should invite him in so he can attach himself to the rest of the word so you can say that you are thinking about doing something. <laughs> that was the Ion Brown that I remembered. And so when this newspaper article described how she would use this very crisp diction while she was doing her pancake demonstrations, I nodded my head. I recognized that. She also said that she would sing gospel songs because she wanted people to know that she was a Christian woman, this was important to her, and that she would focus on children because she figured if they came and had delicious pancakes and left with a favorable impression of a Negro woman that they would carry that forward. And one of the more amazing things of this journey that I've been on since I wrote this book is as I've traveled around the country, I have met many people who remember seeing Aunt Jemima at these Rotarian breakfasts at these church halls. Some of them actually were there with my grandmother. In other cases, they were there with other Aunt Jemima characters, and they have sent me pictures of these women doing their work. The most important part of this, though, is that I was able to learn something about how she did her work. And the other sort of um, uh, subversive, I guess, nature of, of how she did this work is, is that diction that I described, that crisp diction, and that she decided to wear the uniform, but that she wouldn't take on the role completely. The more I did research into Aunt Jemima and the way it advertised at that time, I realized that she, she really was subversive, because if you lived in the late 1940s and early 1950s, if you picked up a magazine or a newspaper, you would, you would see an ad for Aunt Jemima pancake mix. It was, they were a huge advertiser around the country. And the ads were really beautiful. And many of them were created as almost like little novellas. N.C. Wyeth was the illustrator. They were actually quite beautiful. And they were serial ads, not serial as in like the cereal you eat. Cereal, they were serialized ads. They told a story that would pick up in McCall's and Ladies Home Journal, and the story would continue with each successive issue. So for instance, in one of the storylines, there were Confederate soldiers that were wounded and they were so, they were in such bad shape that they were climbing through swamps and dragging themselves through pine forest and they were just about at death's door and they looked out in the distance and they saw a cabin and it had smoke coming from the chimney and it smelled so delicious that they dragged themselves through the pine floor and they found the strength to stand up and knock on the door and oh, Aunt Jemima answered the door and amazingly she said, come on in, I'll serve you pancakes. <laughs> and her pancakes were said to be so delicious that they had almost magical qualities. These Confederate soldiers ate her pancakes and were strengthened for the fight and, and left there and um, gave her great thanks and went on to, um, to join their regiment and, and take up the battle. Um, and in these ads, whenever Aunt Jemima speaks, she speaks in a kind of slave patois that lets you know that she's not a woman who's well-educated or particularly ambitious. Well, Grandma Ione said, I'll take the job, I'll wear the uniform, I'll take the money, 
I'm not interested in that dialect. And she refused to use it. And as I've gotten to know more about the other Anne Jemimas that worked around the country, many of them did the same thing. So as I learn more about this, mining for family history, surprising family history, accidental family history, I was able to take that back and give that to my mother and, and give her really a gift so she could see that her mother had done this work and had taken a job that could have been demeaning and, and did it completely in her own way and used that job to lift herself up, used that income to lift herself up. It explained those little envelopes that she was able to give us when we all went off to college and it explained also how she could pay for all those lovely ensembles. But more than that, she used the job to lift up herself and her people. What a wonderful thing. There is no shame in that. Capturing family history, even when it comes to you by accident. The other, uh, there were many surprising things I learned when I started mining for this history, but the other big one was the thing that I mentioned about my father, that other chapter, the secret that he carried, and he really did carry that to his grave. He never mentioned the fact that he had been shot by a police officer in Birmingham as a very young man to my sisters and I. He never mentioned it to my mother, and just think about that for a minute. Think about that in all the intimacies of marriage over years that you never knew this about your spouse. I am still pained to talk about this, to think about the missed opportunities that I had to talk to him about it. Did he not tell me because it was too painful? Did he not tell me because I never asked? Those questions really fueled my desire to learn as much as I could about the secret that he held. I was able to learn about the basic elements of this, and I got very lucky in that I found people. It turned out that though he never talked about it, that there was this whole army of people in our family, most of them with Birmingham roots, that all knew about it, and they all took a confederacy of silence. They all took a covenant. They all decided not to talk about it until I came knocking. And I was not a really popular person in my family during this period when I was doing research, because I was always trying to get people to talk about things that they didn't want to talk about, and I'd usually show up with food, and they were on to me as soon as I showed up at the door. Because <laughs> I'd have a delicious pie, and they knew that I also had a long list of questions, you know, along with that. But what I was able to, to learn um, is that uh, my father, uh, this incident involving this police officer and the shooting happened on February 7th, 1946, in downtown Birmingham, Alabama. My father raised me in Minnesota, uh, but he was the son of Birmingham. That's where he was from. And it happened on um, a winter evening. It was a Thursday evening. And he was... Um, heading downtown with his brother Woodrow and a family friend named John Beaton who lived just down the road from the family homestead in Alabama in, in, a, in a section of town called Ensley. My father had just been honorably discharged from the Navy. He didn't talk much about his Navy service either and as I learned more about that I understood why. He served in the Navy during a time when the military was greatly segregated. When he enlisted uh, Despite his grades, despite his health, he was sent to the Great Lakes Station in Illinois, and as many men of color, he had two choices. He could either serve as a cook or a baker. Excuse me, two choices, I'm sorry about that. He could either serve as a steward or a cook or a baker. And there was actually a third choice if he happened to be um, a, an accomplished musician. Uh, the musicians could also play in the band and that denoted what kind of um, insignia you wore on your sleeve. So if you were in the band, you wore a musical staff. If you were a steward, you wore an S. If you were in the Cooks and Bakers program, you wore a C. My father wore a C. When he left the, the, uh, the Navy and he, did, he was able to move beyond his initial station as the, um, as the U.S. military began to use men of color in greater capacities, it was determined at one point that the marginalization of men of color was a material aid to the enemy. And so they were able to take on greater roles, but still in a very segregated system. When he returned to Birmingham in February, he returned, like many veterans, as a changed man, and he returned to a city that had not changed all that much. The experience of wearing that uniform had changed many of these veterans, and I now know because even though I hadn't had a chance to talk to my father, I've talked to many of them about their experiences. 
And when he came back to Birmingham, um, he was uh, it, trying to enter a building in downtown Birmingham, a place called the Pythian Temple, and a police officer tried to stop him. And my father stood up to the police officer and tried to assert his rights to enter a public building. Remember, this is February of 1946. And a scuffle ensued, and the police officer reached for a gun, and the gun um, was initially pointed at my father's chest. And my uncle Woodrow swatted at the police officer's gun, and when the gun discharged, it was on a downward arc, and it grazed the side of his leg. And after that, he was arrested. I was able to actually find the arrest records, which was like finding a needle in a haystack after much research. And I was able to find um, how the case was adjudicated. He paid a significant fine, which he had to use um, the money that he received upon discharge from the military and all of the money that uh, his, one of his brothers received, which was a source of tension that I always sensed between the two of them and then now understood where that came from. I also understood something else. As my father, um, for years, all of my life, really until he died, had walked with a, a certain lilt in his step, um, very slight. And I just sort of chalked it up to the kind of um, lilt that you often see in, in a man of color step. A black man often walks with just a little certain, little, little something extra. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Do you know what I'm talking about? If you don't, think of Denzel Washington. <laughs> okay, you know that one foot kind of lands a little bit later than the other one. I think President Obama demonstrates a little bit of this sometimes when he kind of walks up to the, well, there was a little bit of that in my father's step, and, and I just thought it was what they called putting a little English in his step, but his was a little bit more pronounced. And I learned during this research and finally talking to family members about this that, that it was a result of that evening. It was a little bit of a lilt that he had after he received that wound. I also learned that he was entering a building called the Pythian Temple, as I mentioned, but I had to know as much as I could. You know, it was another one of these cases where I got locked, I got trapped. It was unlike journalism where I feel like I have to wrestle a story to the ground. This story was wrestling me to the ground. The more I learned, the more I had to know. The more I knew, the more I had to learn. And I really had to understand why a man of color in Birmingham of 1946 would stand up to a police officer because you know anything about American history, you know that for a man of color to confront a police officer in Birmingham in 1946 would be to invite a certain kind of trouble. I had to understand, even if you were smelling yourself after wearing a military uniform, filling your manhood after experiencing the, 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 the experience of, 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 of being part of a victorious war machine, why would you do that? I needed to understand it. And what I realized is that my father was entering a building where something very important was happening. This is a building, it was a black owned business building that was filled with offices that were owned by doctors, dentists, social clubs, and the like. Usually a place that's pretty quiet on a Thursday evening. But in the evening hours, the Pythian Temple and another black owned building called the Masonic Temple right around the corner in the black business district in Birmingham were humming with activity. They were filled with veterans who were going there to learn as much as they could about the US Constitution. Why? Well, Birmingham, like many places, really the state of Alabama, like many places, had poll taxes, had questions that were asked of people when they tried to register to minimize voter participation among people of color. And the Supreme Court had outlawed the practice of white-only primaries in a case called Smith v. Allwright. And so the states had responded, in the case of Alabama, with something called the Boswell Amendment, which required, which had very specific requirements if you tried to register, particularly if you were a person of color. So sometimes when they first started this, the questions were such that were things like, how many flakes are in a box of laundry detergent? Could you answer that question? How many suds are in a bar of soap? Could you answer that question? Probably not. So what they did after the Smith v. Allwright case is they passed something called the Boswell Amendment, and it held that if you wanted to register to vote, that the registrar could, at their discretion, ask anyone if they understood and could recite any portion of the US Constitution. Now, Birmingham at that point was the epicenter of a voting rights campaign. 
that was centered around the veterans. The, it was decided that Birmingham, because it had a large number of veterans and a large number of veterans who were fairly well educated thanks to um, Parker High School and a, and, a, and a very strong education system for blacks in that city, was the right place to house this voting rights campaign. And so if the veterans realized that they had to know as much about the Constitution, in today's parlance they said, game on. We're going to learn as much about the Constitution as possible. Now again, that thing that I talked about that shifts inside you, when I was doing my research, it shifted again. Because my father, all his life, had walked around with a little brown copy of the Constitution in his back pocket. The men that he rode the bus with, and he rode the bus to work every day, even though he kept a beautifully maintained car in the garage, so beautifully maintained that you could apply makeup in the chrome if you had to, but he would not drive it to work because he said it didn't make sense to pay somebody for parking. So he took the bus. And the people that he took the bus with, they usually read the paper, and they usually read the Star Tribune, and they read about the North Stars, now long gone, or the Vikings or the Twins, sports teams that were always breaking our hearts in Minnesota. But my father would often pull out a little brown copy of the Constitution, and he would read it to his job, all the way to his job as a, as a postal clerk. And then he would pick it up and read it again on the way back. He was always reading this. He would quiz us about it as kids. And um, this is a part of this lecture that gets difficult for me every time because I used to tease him about it when I was a kid. And you talk about shame. I feel a certain amount of shame associated with that because I had no idea. He knew it cold. If he had lived long enough to see this Congress recently recite the Constitution on the House floor, I could imagine him walking around his house with his cardigan and his gold toe slippers reciting it along with them. When I understood that, I understood a little bit more about why he would stand up for his rights to enter that building. Because inside that building was part of his manhood. It was part of his citizenship. It was part of his desire to participate fully in a democracy that he fought for. You see, these veterans fought for democracy overseas and then came back with this crazy notion that they might get a taste of it back home. And America wasn't ready. What I learned is that my father was fortunate in so many ways, not just because the wound was superficial, um, but uh, really because the wound was superficial, but because it could have been so much worse. Again, this happened on February 7th, 1946. In the first six weeks of February of 1946, half a dozen black veterans were killed in and around Birmingham, allegedly by police officers, usually because they were trying to move signs that denoted where coloreds were supposed to sit and where whites were supposed to sit, or because they were trying to register to vote. And that was just Birmingham. One of them was killed two days after my father was wounded. Timothy Hood was shot um, for trying to move a colored only sign on a streetcar. He was uh, wounded just out, actually killed just outside the city. He was shot in the head. He was a Marine. And I've since heard from, um, from some of the sons of the police officers who investigated that case. And one thing that, that I certainly didn't know when I was doing research, and actually many of the people in Birmingham who know this case did not know, is that it was cold that February. It was unusually cold. I did know that. That came up in my research. And Timothy Hood was moving that colored only sign because he wanted to get closer to the heater. He lost his life for that. He was wearing his uniform. That was just in Birmingham. Now, throughout the year in 1946, black veterans were catching heck all over the country, often, again, because they were trying to register to vote. They were beaten and burned and maimed and castrated and lynched and blinded. It was the blinding of a veteran named Isaac Woodard that so troubled President Harry Truman that he took decisive steps to integrate the armed forces after much deliberation. Isaac Woodard was traveling from Fort Gordon in Georgia to his home in North Carolina, and as they were passing through South Carolina, he asked the bus driver about using the restroom. The bus driver did not like his tone, so he used a radio to call ahead to make sure that police officers would greet him in a little town called Batesburg, South Carolina. 
The police officers pulled him into an alley and they beat him with blackjacks, which are basically bully clubs that have metal, um, lead pellets inside them. And they beat him principally about the face and the eyes, such that he was blinded for life after that. He had been honorably discharged for less than four hours when this happened and he was still wearing his uniform. When the case was adjudicated later that summer, the police officers involved in that case were acquitted and the jury erupted in cheers and there was a second wave of cheers for people who were not able to find seats in the courtroom and they cheered outside. Harry Truman was so troubled by this that this could happen in America, that it could happen to a, a, a man in uniform, wearing the uniform of the US military, that he wrote a series of letters about this to his family members who did not want him to segregate the armed forces, to his friends, and he talked about how troubled he was by this case. And he finally decided that he had had enough, that he was gonna segregate the armed forces because of Isaac Woodard and the loss of his sight. Now, we're in a university setting, a lot of very educated people in this room. How many of you have heard of Isaac Woodard? One, two, three, four. I can't see back there, so I don't know how many people are raising their hands, but I'm not seeing a lot of hands go up. And I ask this question wherever I go, and I'm surprised, less surprised as time goes on, to know that many people don't know about Isaac Woodard, and they don't know his impact on presidential history, on US history. It's a history that's been lost to us because the people who lived it decided to stop talking about it. And it's understandable because, boy, it's a tough history. We want to be proud of the military, so we might not want to talk about that aspect of that. The men who experienced this want to move forward, so they decide not to talk about it. But it's a history that we've lost. And people ask me all the time, when I worked on this, 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 this research and, and was writing this book, that you must be so angry based on what you found. Anger is not the place that I landed. I landed at a place called Wonder, W-O-N-D-E-R, because I realized that I was raised by people who had every reason to be angry at the world and decided not to be. I talked to my, I didn't talk to my father about this because I never had a chance to, but I talked to so many other veterans and to a person, they never talked about their experiences in the military or if they experienced marginalization or brutalization when they came home, they didn't talk about it to their wives, to their lovers, to their sons or their daughters. They kept it to themselves. Why? Well, it's difficult to talk about that if you want to move forward. Part of it was self-preservation, but part of it was something so much greater than that. Part of it was a desire to help the next generation move forward without the burdens of their frustrations. What an incredible act of grace. It's why I use the word grace in the title of my book. Because in deciding not to feed the next generation with tales of constant woe, in some ways they shoved the whole country forward. They decided to try to show the country what they could be, and in doing that, showing the country what it could be. What an incredibly graceful act. As difficult as this journey is, I was so grateful that I found the I in history, that I was able to uncover my family story. And when people ask me about being angry about this or ask me why dredge this stuff up, again, I land in a different place. Because my history, I've discovered, is part of my wealth. I've been able to now, as difficult as it is to know this, I've been able to pass this on to my children who will never take for granted the things that are available to them today. They understand this country in a different way because they understand what it used to be so that they appreciate what it is now. They understand that bad things may happen to them, but it does not have to define them. People will ask me often, Someone may ask me this tonight, because I do get this question all the time. You called your book The Grace of Silence, and yet you're advocating that people go and try to find more about their history. It is a bit of a conundrum. One of the reasons that men like my father did not talk about their experiences is because they didn't want to weigh us down. If you want your children to soar, you don't necessarily want to put rocks in their pockets. 
You don't want to weigh them down with boulders because you want them to take flight. But it's okay to put, perhaps, pebbles in their pockets or pearls of wisdom so that they are grounded, so that they understand where they came from and they are stronger for it. In my case, I inherited a rather complex racial her heritage or legacy, but I wonder, as I look out at you, how many of you really know your own histories? And this is something that I have been slightly, if I can use this word without um, <laughs> but blaspheming anyone, become rather um, evangelical about, is encouraging people to think about family history, community history, um, university history. How much do you really know? Whether your family members survived the Dust Bowl or the Depression or the Holocaust, whether they were immigrants who came to this country with little more than two cents that they could rub together, chances are you might not know the entire story. Chances are you might not know your entire story. America is a country full of people who came here and basically reinvented themselves. And with that reinvention comes something wonderful, but you also lose something. And so I, I, I encourage people, whether you read the book or not, to think about your own histories and think about the wealth um, that is within that history because, again, it really is wealth. Long before people amassed wealth based on dollar bills that had dead presidents on them or through currency or through bank balances, your history was your wealth in ancient times. That's how people accumulated wealth by the stories that they told. And if the story was interesting, it meant that it had sorrow and triumph. It had peaks and valleys. That's what made it rich. And that's what makes all of our stories rich, even when they're, when they're difficult. There is grace and silence, but there's power in history. And that's one of the most important lessons that I learned. One of the other lessons that I learned, and I, I I cherish the opportunity to share this, particularly on college campuses, is that um, in an age where we think about activism uh, in, a, in a very robust way, I learned important lessons about what it, what it means to be an activist when I was doing this research. Uh, we've seen interesting things just in the last year. We watched dictators topple one after the other in a series of countries during the Arab Spring. Um, I think if you, uh, if you looked at the word that probably had the most currency in describing a single year in 2011, I think Occupy would probably be a strong contender. Um, the person of the year on Time Magazine this year was an activist, was a protester. And I think many people in this generation, as people in my generation perhaps did, I was born in, um, actually, if you read the book, you'll figure out where I was born. <laughs> Let's just say I came of age in the 70s. And I think in that period, much like young people today, I thought activism was loud. I thought activism had big afros and long hair. I thought activism was something that manifested itself in, wearing, in the wearing of daishikis and love beads, in putting fists in the air and holding placards and marching through the streets. Activism got in your face. Activism was aggressive. What I learned in doing this research for this book and, and really understanding my family members in new ways is that sometimes activism whispers. Sometimes activism is just doing your job better than anybody expected you to do it. Sometimes activism is getting an education. Sometimes activism is quietly standing up for something that you believe. I never understood that, and I never appreciated that until now, and it's one of the lessons that I so greatly cherish, because what it tells me is that activists, those people who make the world a better place, those people who push us forward, are not just the ones who are memorialized in stone. They live among us. Our heroes live among us. Our activists live among us. It means that it's something that's much closer to the ground. It's not just for those who soar close to the sun. It's for those who walk among us. We all can make a difference. We all can do things in our own special way. And the other important lesson that I learned in this journey 
even though I called the book The Grace of Silence, is the power of words. The power of words in telling our stories um, and the power of words in sharing ourselves. I have a very different view of history now. I've always, you know, even though I write the first draft of history as a journalist every day, I've always thought of history, history, as sort of this big thing with a capital H, the stuff that's in textbooks, the stuff that you learn in wonderful institutions like this, and I now realize that history with a small H is something that I think about in a different way, and I encourage people really to try to find the I in history. But I've learned something else about the power of words, and I'll share this with you in, in closing. When I set out to talk about this book, I knew that I would be asking people to listen to me talk about a difficult subject, race. The history of race in America. It's tough. It's not easy stuff. It's not easy even today. And I knew that it might be uncomfortable at times because race is something that is not easy to talk about. And so I thought, well, how am I going to make sure that the audience feels comfortable? Because more than anything, what I wanted to do with this book as a journalist was to start to spark a conversation. So I thought, well, if I want to try to make this a little bit more comfortable or to try to lubricate this process a little bit, perhaps I could play the race card quite literally play the race card. Um, I've never liked that term, and so I thought I would take it on its head, and I think when you walked in the room, you probably got copies of these cards. And it really was sort of a, an act of desperation on my part to figure out how to get people involved in the process. And what I did is on a Saturday afternoon before I set out to um, actually go out on a book tour, I went to Kinko's near my neighborhood, and I said, I want to I create this race card, and I came up with a sort of design, and the idea was to invite people to share their thoughts, experience, hopes, dreams, laments, observations about race, identity, or culture, but there were rules. You only got one sentence, and that sentence could only have six words. It's almost like a little haiku. And I printed up 200 of them, and I was surprised at how many came back to me. Uh, in some cases, people who had heard my story decided to share their own. And they started with six words, and then they just kept going. Because people saw something of themselves in my parents' story. Sometimes they were German immigrants who said, we had a similar experience when we moved into a neighborhood and everybody moved out. Or sometimes they were people who were Dutch who lived among the Germans. And they said, we live in a community, and everyone said, you know, in that, in that time, if you ain't Dutch, you ain't much. And it was uncomfortable for us, and they shared their story too. I printed up 200 of these, and about 30% came back to me. People filled them out, put a postage on it, and sent it back to me, and I thought, wow, I think I have something here. So I printed out more, and I started distributing them. And then thanks to Facebook and Twitter, they have gone all over the place. And I now have thousands of them, six-word essays where people share their story, uh, and, and often in sharing that, saying something that they haven't uttered, haven't really put down on paper before. And they've come from all over the country, and again, thanks to Facebook and Twitter, they've come from really interesting places around the world. I have them from Osaka and Brisbane and Afghanistan and, and Abu Dhabi and, um, and, and uh, 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 all kinds of places. And those six words are often just the beginning of of a story, one man handed me his six word card in North Carolina and um, his six words were race is throwing rocks at kids. He didn't want to give me his name. His card came in and it just said anonymous, but he gave me a story. He was a man who looked to be in his 70s and he explained to me that in the Raleigh-Durham area when they were integrating the school system there, um, there were a lot of people who didn't think it was a good idea, and he was among them. And there were people who st tried to stop students of color from crossing the color barrier to enter previously all-white schools, and he was among them. He said there were people who sometimes threw tomatoes and vegetables and bricks and rocks at students, and he was among them. And he said that he knows that he made contact and so he explained that when he would walk around the Raleigh-Durham area and if he saw a person of color, a black man or woman, who was a similar age 
as he was, he would immediately look at their forehead because he was looking for something very specific. After all these years, he was looking for a scar, but also for the opportunity to say, I'm sorry. He was almost weeping when he gave me that card. And he said he'd never put those words to paper before. He'd never said it out loud, but somehow the ability to just get it out of his system did just that. It helped him get something out of his system. And so I encourage you tonight um, to think about participating in this project, pro project. I call it the race card project. It started as a crazy experiment. And now that I have thousands of these, I post them on a website. Uh, if you actually visit the site and look at these statements, it is, it is in some way accomplishing what I set out to do at the beginning, to eavesdrop on the American conversation about race. It's the conversation that you never hear because it's things said that people generally don't say in polite society. It's real and it's raw. Sometimes it'll make you laugh, sometimes it'll make you squirm. It will always make you think of life as lived by someone else. And so before um, I close, I want to do one thing. I want to read a few of them, and I want you to think about each of these and remember that each of them came in as little six-word essays, six-word spurts, people sharing their story. And if you do go to the site or if you look at this, I encourage you to think about saying them out loud because it really is something to read someone else's truth, to, to state their truth out loud. Um, this is something I did really at the request of Anna Devere Smith. How many of you know she is the actress and um, monologist? She's followed this and she said, you, you, you need to read these out loud because if you read them out loud, they really do sound like a conversation. And when I actually just jumbled a few of them together, they do. They sound like America is actually talking to each other about the subject that we generally don't talk about. So let's take a listen. Six words, all of these. Race in six words. It matters, like it or not, much ado about nothing. We are still a racist society. Race does not exist by itself. Race is everything, but it's nothing. Today's soft segregation harms everyone. Soul has no color. Black wears me wherever I go. Black children cost less to adopt. I admit to unconscious racial bias. Does not define who I am. A costume mistaken for an actor. Who I am, who I am not. Racism is a shackle, I broke mine. Sometimes racism is self-imposed. Step on backs to raise yourself, still working harder than others are. The point of it all, power. Get your feet off our necks. Blacks complain constantly despite obvious progress, but I voted for Barack Obama. Colors run together, why can't people? I hear my grandfather's hateful words. White man vilified, what I do. Racism I inherited breaks my heart. Think Dr. Seuss and the Sneetches. Race to the border, and the person who wrote this one scratched that out and then wrote, no, make that race is the border. Diversity don't count if it's white. Pay no attention to my packaging. I am still not from Vietnam. Please stop saying I am articulate. <laughs> see me, see black, see nothing. I am fortunate to be Caucasian. I assume black women hate me. Easy to assume I am guilty. My great-great-grandfather owned slaves. Would Martin Luther King support gay rights? Born, colored, children, African-American. Progress? Can I love who I want? Reason I ended a sweet relationship. A terrible, unnecessary barrier against love. Black woman, white man, golden children. I will not ruin your bloodline. Korean marries Italian in Chinese garden. <laughs> no one word to describe me. Obama is mixed, black and white. Shamefully, conveniently, I own half of me. The hybrids shall inherit the earth. My son is not half, he's double. Someone wrote, it all goes downhill after these six words. I am not a racist, but let's all hit the reset button. Every now and then I remember. Grandparents passed, 
New tree, no roots. Terrified, you assume I'm judging you. Still the elephant in the room, what a tangled web we wove. Rebecca, black maid, taught me love. The complicated, cruel history of man. No one is born a racist. Sad I learned, sad and hopeful. What if the world were colorblind? Colorblindness is not goal. Celebrate colors. Let us all live sweetly together. Start with kids and mix well. Skin color is God's gift wrapping. Our untold stories keep us separate. And I think for now my personal favorite, underneath we all taste like chicken. <laughs> Race in Six Words, The Race Card Project. Thank you very much. I wrote this, this book and embarked on this journey because I really did want to widen the conversation, and so I hope that conversation can continue tonight because we do have time for questions, and hopefully I'll provide answers that make sense. So there are microphones um, right over here to the right, or at least to my right, and then up on the second level um, over on the left-hand side, and if you have a question, we do ask that you make your way to a microphone because it's much easier for the rest of the audience to hear you at that point. Um, and while people make their way to the microphone, I will make a personal plea for people here in the great state of Indiana to participate in the Race Card Project. And during the redesign for the website that we're working on right now, we did a geographic cloud, and we have a sense of where we have strong representation in terms of people who've submitted essays and where our representation is weak. And I have to say, Indiana is underrepresented right now. So you have a chance to do something about that. And we have a question on the right-hand side. Uh, Long-time listener, first-time caller. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, you were talking about your parents leaving you pebbles so that you could still soar. And I'm wondering what kind of pebbles they taught you enough to protect yourself. Well, they, you know, they would meet it out very carefully. And it, and it, was, it, was, uh, it was like living in a world, world of vertigo because on one hand, they would tell you, you know, race doesn't matter. Uh, you have to go out there and you have to prove yourself and you have to do well and you have to lift the entire family up. But race doesn't matter, but you better work twice as hard as everybody else because that's what's going to be required of you. So, you know, it's, it's sort of trying to take both of those, those things in. Um, they did give us a sense, though, that, that we did have to work hard and that maybe we would have to work harder. Uh, I talk to my mom about this now. My dad is gone, but my mom is still is still living, and my kids are actually with her right now. And um, and I, I ask her for advice about what to tell my own kids. And this is a hard one, because I don't want them to go looking for something. You know, I, I certainly don't want them to think the world owes them anything because bad things happen to their their ancestors. That is not, you know, Belvin and Betty Norris did not raise me to then raise my own children with that expectation. But at the same time, I do want them to be ready. Um, I want them to be clear-eyed. I don't want them to go looking for something, but if they see it, I want them to be able to combat it and push past it and maybe lead by example and, and show, you know, to, to, to be the change that you, that you want to see. But it's hard. It's, I'm going to be really honest with you I'm, I'm, because that's, I'm, I'm trying to lead an honest conversation, so I'm going to be really honest with you. It's hard. I have a son, for instance. I have a son and a daughter, and then I have an older son, a stepson. But I know um, this applies to my younger son and my older son. Again, I'm going to be honest with you. I know that I want him to go into the world and not expect um, that he will be treated differently, but I know that at some point he might be. I know that if he goes to a mall with his friends Seth and Josh, and if they're all wearing the ridiculous clothes that kids wear today, with the pants, the saggy pants. Do we hate the saggy pants? Okay, I, I know that some of you might be wearing the saggy pants, but there are some of us who really have a problem with the saggy pants. You know, they might be wearing the saggy pants and the big jackets, the big, like, can you just buy a jacket in your size? Do you have to wear the really big jacket? Um, and that they might go into the mall, and I, and I know that he might be followed 
or looked at more closely than his friends who are not kids of color. So how do I prepare him for that so that he can give that the Kanye shrug and keep on going? Um, so that he doesn't leave that store with his fist balled up, so that he does not adopt the expectations that are laid on him in that moment. And that's really hard. And I try to figure out, I'm, I'm not going to tell you that I have the answers to that question because I don't, but I pray on that and I think hard about it and I try to have um, honest conversations with them. And as they get older, those conversations change. He's 11 right now. So the kind of conversation that I can have with him now is different than it will be at 17. But I hope that I can keep him grounded, but at the same time let him understand that he can soar and that he's not burdened by stereotypes or defined by stereotypes of his own making or of societies. So I hope I answered your, your question. Thank you. Peace and blessings. Thank um, you. Thank you for bringing this unspeakable conversation into the clear light of day. Um, have you read Michelle Alexander's work? I have. Can you please speak to the new Jim Crow? Yes, I can, I can. Um, by the way, is that a radio voice or what? <laughs> uh, Michelle, how many of you have read Michelle Alexander's book about the new Jim Crow? It is a book that looks at the incarceration complex in this country um, and the large, uh, the disproportionately high rate of incarceration for people of color, for African Americans, increasingly for Latinos, um, and what that means for not just the individuals or the communities that they come from, but for us all. Because it basically takes people who are in one, you know, part of a larger social cohort and pulls them out and, um, and creates a sort of, and she argues, a parallel social structure that makes it difficult for them to become productive members of society on the um, other end of this. It's, it's a fascinating um, read and her research, and it's really fascinating to read that book in light of um, something that just aired on local PBS, on PBS stations all across the country. Uh, a wonderful documentary by Doug Blackman based on his Pulitzer Prize winning book called Slavery by Another Name. I don't know how many of you saw this um, documentary. It was just, it aired last week and it's streaming online and I think it's being rebroadcast in several markets over the month of February, Black History Month. Um, but it looks at the, the peonage system um, in, in Alabama and how um, the the industrial complex in Alabama, when they needed workers, they would basically turn to sheriffs who would arrest men of color in large numbers and then lease them back. It's a convict leasing program that was um, quite large and at one point affected one in seven black men in Alabama. Um, it, was, it was really massive. And when they started this, the incarceration rate for men of color went up, um, I think it was 800%. In, in a three-year period. So her, her work is interesting. And, um, and I, she was just in Indiana. I, I don't know how I, I think I know that from Twitter or Facebook or something. But um, thank you for pointing it out. And I would encourage you to take a, take a look at it. Question here? Hi. Hello. And thank you for coming. Um, are these things hard for you to talk about? They're very hard to talk about. How old are you, sweetie? Ten. Ten. You are very poised at that microphone. Thank you very much for coming here tonight, and thank you to your family for letting you stay up a little bit late so you could come out tonight. Um, they are still hard for me to talk about. There, there are certain um, pieces of the story that are still very difficult for me to talk about, particularly my father. I lost my father, and in fact, um, the last time I saw him alive was here in Fort Wayne. Um, he took ill when he was visiting his brother here in Fort Wayne, and I put him on a plane at the airport. In fact, it's the first chapter of my book. And I was going to drive the car back to Minneapolis, and I didn't make it back there before we lost him. Um, so it is sometimes very difficult to talk about these things, but I do it because I think, um, I think it helps. I think it is of use. And, um, and so it's worth it for me to do it, even though it's difficult. 
Now, because you were 10 years old and so well-spoken, I'm gonna use this opportunity to, um, to suggest something else for anybody else who wants to have a conversation about your own history or you want to capture family history. Um, for instance, if you've ever heard of StoryCorps, if you listen to Morning Edition, Dave Isay, who's the creator of StoryCorps, has a holiday called the National Day of Listening. It's the day after Thanksgiving, and it's on that day he encourages people to capture family history. Instead of going to the mall, if you have to go to the mall, God bless you, go ahead, have fun. But to take part of that day to sit down with a family member and record family history and to do that every year so that you build that wealth that I talk about, that you make a deposit every year into that bank and, and collect your family history. Well, sometimes it's hard to do. Sometimes people don't want to talk about it. So since we have a wonderful 10-year-old, what's your name? Maya. Maya. Since Maya has asked this question, I'm going to remind you if you're at a point where you have relatives who don't really want to talk about their history, if you have children who are as wonderfully articulate as Maya, use them prodigiously. <laughs> it helped me when I was doing my research. My mother, for instance, did not really want to talk to me about um, some of the things that I was asking her about. But after a while, my daughter Asia, she's 12, she's just a little bit older than her brother, would start asking my mother questions. And my mother wouldn't talk to me, but she would talk totally openly to Asia. And then I realized, oh, this is how it's gonna have to work. So, <laughs> and over time, I think she was on to me, but it was almost like, um, if you play pool, it's like a rim shot. You know, she knew that I was recording it, she knew that I was taking notes, but it was easier for her to talk to the, my 12-year-old than it was to tell me some of those stories. So when you're gathering family history, children can be incredibly useful. So thank you very much for, um, for your question tonight. Thank you for actually answering my question. <laughs> Hello. Hello. I have uh, enjoyed you so much on the radio and so much tonight. Thank you for being here. I wanted to ask you, you talked about how the silence was so graceful in your family and how it was, it, I, I, I've been standing here trying to find the right words for this, but it almost held back the bitterness, mm -hmm. I think, is what you meant. Mm -hmm. um, and I wondered how you felt about new generations carrying on the bitterness of parents and grandparents who were not as graceful and who chose to pass along their anger um, in many cultures. Yes. Not yes. just the African-American yes. culture, yes. but in many cultures. And, and, and if you could talk about that, if you've, I'm sure you found that. I, I have found that. And, and, and almost everywhere I go, I get a version of a, of a question like this. And frankly, I. Um, I have other members of my family and other people in our wider circle of you know, extended family, people who aren't really family but are so close to you that they're kind of like family. Mm -hmm. And you'll meet one of them in, in, in the book um, who are, have blistering anger. And that's how they cope. They, in fact, their anger, they hold on to their anger because it, they need to hold on to it. They want to remember. They need to remember. They don't ever want to forget. And, if that's how they cope, you almost have to honor that also. Um, and, and sometimes what they want, un unlike, I guess, my folks who decided to keep everything in, they may perhaps need an audience. And sometimes one of the reasons that people hold on to anger is because no one is listening to them. You know, they, no one is validating what they're experiencing. So sometimes just hearing them out, um, I'm not saying it always works, but it can be a valve, you know, to let, to let, um, to let some of that, that pressure off. You know, it's hard to tell someone that their anger is not justified. And it's hard to tell someone that you, you shouldn't be angry. You know, that, that doesn't, that, that is, that's turning the valve the other way, frankly. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so that's, you know, it's, it's difficult, it's difficult to do. But if, if you can figure out how to validate that, but at the same time protect yourself because that anger can feel like a blowtorch. And, um, and anger can be corrosive, it can also be contagious. And so it's, you know, it's figuring out the boundaries um, for yourself to, to you know, get close enough to it that perhaps you can listen to them, but to protect yourself at the same time. I don't know if I've answered e exactly what you were getting at. Yeah, a little bit, a little bit. And, and I, I guess, um, 
I guess the best ways to insulate yourself if you are that audience and you understand that justifiable anger, you know, because like you said, there are many things to be angry about. Um, but to move forward, we have to look forward. Yeah, too, and, and which I what? thought was really powerful when you said that. Well, but there's also there's you know there's many sides to this. I mean, my parents didn't talk a lot about this, but it doesn't mean that they got over it. I mean, I I now recognize the effect of carrying all of that internal anger um, in my family. I see the effect that it had on my father, and it was almost like carrying around a 20 pound weight, 50 pound weight, 100 pound weight, wherever. He went. I see what it did to him. I see what it did to their marriage, quite honestly. I write about this. Um, and I see the dynamic that it created, you know, in the family. So emoting too much is, you know, on one extreme and keeping everything in is the other extreme. And both of them are not perhaps the healthiest way, you know, to, to deal with things. But all of it, I mean, the, 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 the way that this generation that lived through the civil rights movement, and again, so many people, there are people in this room, I bet, who were raised by people who, much like my parents, saw much but said little. That is amazing to me in these times, because we live in a culture of complaint right now. I mean, if you go to Starbucks and they get your half-calf latte wrong, you might tweet about it, right? And, you know, and for people who, who really saw a lot, whether it's, you know, not just black veterans, but all World War II veterans, World War I veterans, people who lived through the Depression, people who really saw hardship um, and, and didn't, you know, decided to be stoic about it, decided not to um, complain constantly or um, outwardly about it is, is really even more incredible given the times that we live in now. Thank you for your question. Greetings, Michelle. Greetings. Michelle. <laughs> we have a program locally, uh, It Is Well With My Soul, which is a Kellogg Foundation American Healing Initiative. And our strategy for healing from uh, racial healing is ancestral and historical research, publication, and presentation. So um, your lecture today has just been extremely uplifting uh, to me. And my question is, have any of those who wrote to you or do you address the healing from internalized racism and oppression? Uh, I, I don't necessarily address it, but I recognize the power of it and I see it from lots of different sides. Um, you know, it's healing for people to tell their stories. I realized that in my family, that once people started telling stories, even if they didn't want to say that, it didn't want to share those stories, once that spigot opened, it was like a grand exhale for them. You know, you could see it in their body language, you could hear it, you could, and they would tell me that, you know, it felt good to be able to talk about this after all these years. I've seen it on the other side. You know, the police officers that were involved in my father's shooting, I tried desperately to track them down because I wanted to know, I wanted to know about their lives and I wanted to meet their kids. And they were, they were all gone, so I wasn't able to talk to any of them, but I did find police officers who were on the force at that time and talked to them. And since then, I have heard from the sons of usually, well, daughter also, but sons and daughters of police officers in Birmingham, Alabama. And that's been fascinating to me because when you think about police officers in Birmingham, Alabama, you think of two words usually, right? Bull Connor. But there was a big force, and Bull Connor defined that force. There were several men who served on that force, and we don't know a whole lot about their lives, whether they agreed with everything that Bull Connor stood for, what their lives were like, and and the people who've reached out to me have talked to me about how wonderful it is for them to finally talk about this because they either thought no one was interested or they felt like they, this, these were things that they couldn't talk about. And, and they talk about the interior lives of these police officers you know, who were on the front lines of change in America at this moment when the world was literally shifting under their feet. And, um, and we don't know a lot about that. So as a journalist, I'm interested in that, but as a human being, I'm, you know, I'm interested in, the, in, again, the power of words and the power of storytelling. It's, again, what you hear at StoryCorps. It's why we're drawn to the, you know, the radio every Friday morning, and some of us don't put on our makeup until we leave because you, know, you wind up crying as you're listening to those stories. But it's the, the power of, of um, you know, that sort of, there is a human urge to share a story. I will say this, when you're talking about racial history, it can be difficult um, 
if you are, if your family line reaches back to a place where people in your family enjoyed segregation, enforced segregation, looked the other way during segregation. This is, this is again, part of the, the sort of tough stuff in this conversation, because if you're talking about sharing stories and it's a story of overcoming something, that's one thing. If it's a story of people who didn't really want to see segregation end, or a story that involves um, people who have complicated views around segregation even now, that's a little bit harder. And I, you know, I don't know how you get to healing in that place, but my point of view is that you can't have a conversation about race in America if you're not going to include different sides at the table. And if the conversation about race is always just about people who've overcome you know, the civil rights struggles in America, that's really a one-sided conversation. And what we're talking about is not black history, what we're talking about is American history. And if we look at it that way, I think it's easier to make more places at that table when we try to have that conversation. I'm, I'm currently teaching a graduate class at Ball State where we're dealing with racial autobiographies and looking at structural racism and whiteness, pr power, privilege, and internalized racism. And it is a difficult conversation, but um, the students are finding that it's so worthwhile to have these conversations to learn more so that they could do better. Thank you.